Listen, uh, God, this God that we serve is so great. He's worthy of everything that we have. And this morning, I want to challenge you as we journey in this time of worship to present your whole self an offering unto God. He's worthy of that. He's worthy of you singing with everything that you have, of you standing here before him today and presenting your whole self, uh, a witness and an example to others unto him. And uh, so I challenge you not just today, but every day to give yourself wholly over to the Lord. I want to just welcome you this morning to Greenbrier Road Baptist Church. It's a blessing that you have chosen to be with here, be with us here today, uh, especially for those of you who are guests this morning. We honor you. We welcome you. Some of you have had the opportunity already to greet, and I am so glad that you are here today. If you would take the opportunity this morning to take the card that's in the pew in front of you and just put your uh, information on there, you can let that be your offering to us at the end of the service. We sure would like to send you a letter of welcome and uh, just some information about our church in the mail, and we know you'll be blessed as you find that and find ways that you might... Uh, I want to journey deeper into the into Greenbrier and see a little bit more about who we are and what we do. And uh, so if we can be of any assistance to you, please feel free to ask one of us. We'd love to help you in this journey. Uh, whatever you're looking for today, whether it's Jesus or a church, uh, we are going to be praying for you and asking God to direct you in the days ahead. We uh, just want to welcome you. As you see, things are a little different this morning. This is not our normal uh, church decoration. So welcome to the ball field. Okay, some of you, how many of you feel like you lived there the past few months? Okay, there you go. Some of you can feel right at home at the ball field. Uh, tonight, we I, I'm so thankful, by the way, that we love uh, children and youth here to the point that we can rearrange things for a day or two or for a week or two for vacation Bible school and children's musicals and all those kinds of things so we can make uh, a great impact in the life of children. And so tonight at 5 p.m., we'll be presenting the Sermon on the Mound. And our children have been working really hard all semester. It's going to be a great time if you want to have fun. If you want to be taught from children, then come tonight. I promise you, you will be challenged. I promise you something funny will happen tonight, because it always does when you put children on stage. So come ready to laugh. Come ready to be ministered to. And it'll be a wonderful time tonight. I usually don't make announcements uh, at this time in our service, but I wanted to make you aware of, of why we have it decorated up like a ball field. This guys are, guys are playing from behind the dugout back there. Uh, so uh, anyways, we're glad that you're here, and let's just uh, take this time if you would and join me in prayer. Father, what a blessing it is to know Jesus. 
What a blessing it is to know that there is nothing greater in this world than our God. Father, as we have st stand, stood and sang how great thou art, God, I pray that we have meant what we have sung. Father, I pray that you would use this service today to get all the glory and the honor that you are due out of every person that's here. Father, may it start in my heart this morning as the leader that you have called to this place that I could set the tone, God, by how I respond to you in worship and in the preaching and teaching of your word that God would be an overflow out of my life and the life of every person that's here to join me in an invitation to worship you this morning. Father, there's not a place, and I honestly can say this, Lord, to you today, that there's not a place that I'd rather be in this whole world than in your house worshiping this morning. Lord, I've come to fully devote myself to you, to put myself as a living sacrifice, and I pray that, God, in this moment, others would join as they put themselves out there, God, for you, for you to use, for you to speak to, and most importantly, I say, Lord, help me be obedient today. However you speak to me, help me to respond with a yes. God, help others to respond in the same way. And Father, I know when we leave this place, we can honestly say if we put our yes on the table, that it was great to be in your house. It was great to be spoken to from your word and to worship you with other believers. So Lord, I pray your great blessing upon this faith family today, that you would be honored in how we worship you. Amen. As you would stand as we sing, blessed is your name. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I found it. 
and say and admit is that we need Jesus. That Lord, I need you. Child of God. 
because he lives. Amen. We're so thankful, Father, that we are free from sin. The bondage of sin, Father. As your word says, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. And though we may fall, and our flesh sometimes calls us to sin, sin, we know that we have an advocate with the Father through Jesus Christ. So thankful that we're no longer slaves to fear this morning. Through the power of the cross, we do not have to fear or be afraid. Because greater is he that is in us than he who is in the world. And you have overcome the world, Father, through Jesus. We're so thankful we can sing these songs this morning. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. say amen. Anybody else want to say amen? I was sitting there telling myself, man, if you don't want to preach after that, you need to change jobs. Like, you need to get a new career path. That is amazing. Thank you for leading us. And I'll tell you, worship's not like that everywhere. You don't get the opportunity to come before the throne of the Lord like that. So what a blessing. Thank you for those of you who led us this morning. If you have your copy of God's Word, turn with me to Romans, the sixth chapter. This will be our last uh, ser uh, sermon out of the Gospel Driven Life series, Romans chapter six. We're going to talk about being alive in the gospel. Alive in the gospel. So I want you to join me as you turn to Romans chapter 6. The most important part of our time together will be encountering God in his word. What God says will be the most important thing that we hear from today. I will have a lot of words to say. We had a lot of people sing words that man wrote. And some of those words this morning came from the scriptures itself. But the most important thing that we do will be hear from God. And so I hope and pray that you've come and your desire this morning is to hear from God. And so I want to invite you to just, just open yourselves to hear God's word this morning. We're in a series called The Gospel Driven Life. This idea that the gospel should affect every aspect of our lives as followers. Not just a one-time decision. The gospel is not something we just do one time in a prayer when we were younger or sometime in the past. But it's a... It's a, it's a Something that we should, as uh, J.D. Greer said, swim around in. It's just something that could affect every area of our life. We're basing this series out of Romans 1 and 16 where it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. This believes, again, present tense. This, this as we live this life, this gospel is our power. And we want to talk about that this morning. The question that I want to address this morning as we dive right in this morning is can I continue to sin after I receive the gospel? Can I continue to sin after I receive the gospel? It's a question that often people struggle with. I look around the room, there's people that I know of that I have counseled with, numerous people over the past nine years and some months that I've been able to walk with in this struggle of, of sin. They'll come to me and they'll say, well, pastor, I still see it. I'm struggling with sin and, and I'm struggling to how much sin can I commit and still be saved that's what often the question that may arise is is how much sin is too much sin in the life of the believer do I maybe another question that comes pastor do I need to get saved every time I sin now there are some denominations and some theological teachings out there that would say well of course you need to get saved after you sin every time you sin you need to get saved or you're going to die and you're going to go to hell so I want us to look into God's word this morning in Romans chapter 6 verses 1 through 14 and I want to get us the, some answers to our questions. I want us to hear what God has to say from his word through the apostle Paul as he writes. I want us to this question to propel us into this chapter and see what the Bible has to say. This uh, probably became really uh, realistic in my life and, and I'll illustrate it this way. When I was a freshman at JSU back in 1998-99. 
uh, excuse me, 99. Yeah, I've been 99 in 2000. Um, we were walking, obviously, we walked to class and you go through the quad a lot. Some of you guys still walk through the quad and you go to the calf to the quad and you do all these kinds of things and you, it's kind of a central meeting area. There's a lot of people that pass by there. Well, I remember this one spring day or week that the, the, uh, there were some preacher men on the quad. That's what we called them. The preacher men are at the quad. And so a man in the classes, everybody's talking about, oh, there's preacher men at the quad. And, and what that meant was, uh, I, it was so impactful in my life, to be honest with you, that I still remember one of the preacher's names. His name was Brother John. Well, Brother John's down at the quad and he's preaching. Him and his buddy, his sidekick, they're preaching. And what I meant by pre preaching when they said that is they were condemning people as they walked by. They were screaming and yelling insults with scripture at people as they walked by. And it was, it was, you know, they were yelling at the top of their lungs, slurs of condemnation is how I wrote it down in my notes. And, uh, and they would say to the people, they'd call out the fraternities and they'd say, are you in a fraternity? Well, you're just a, dr you're, you're in the sin of drunkenness just because you're in a fraternity. You know, are you in a sorority? Well, you are a whoremonger, you know, and they're yelling at them and just calling them out. And boy, it just, it just invoked this, uh, this sense of passion amongst the students. And so now, you know, after a few minutes, there's a crowd of people gathered around and there's this yelling back and forth and and I remember at one of the moments now this was about a two-day process but on, on the on the second day I remember in this moment at the quad that brother John in one of his tirades as he is yelling slurs of condemnation back and forth at each other I remember he made this claim he said if you still sin then you need to get saved if you still sin you need to get saved he said, I have not sinned since 1985. At that time, 14 years. I have not committed a sin since 1985. And so I remember some of the boys, you know, yelling out, well, you just did, you're a liar. <laughs> You've got the sin of pride and arrogance, you know. And so it's this back and forth. But that, that question, that, that statement that he made was, if you still live in sin, if you're, not, not live in sin, if you still sin, you need to get saved. And I began to think, you know, that's something we need to flesh out. It's something we need to ask ourselves, what, is this, what does this mean? Ultimately, these men were ran off a of campus because some of the fraternity boys went and dumped sugar in their gas tanks. So anyways, um, quite a stir on campus that week. I say this story, though, to raise a question regarding the Christian and sin. What does it mean to be a Christian when it regards to sin? Can we live a life without sin once we commit to follow Jesus? Can we sin as much as we want to after we get saved because we live under grace and we have a license to sin now? I want us to look at what the Apostle Paul says, Romans 6, starting in verse 1. Would you stand to honor the reading of the Word of God with me this morning as we read the first 14 verses the Apostle Paul writes. Now remember the gospel driven life. This gospel should affect our whole life, every bit of our life, even the life where we struggle with sin. The gospel should have an impact, this power. Verse 1 of Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live in it? any longer. Or do you not know that as many as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in a newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise also, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lust, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God, for sin shall not have dominion 
dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. May God bless the reading of his word and uh, us as we respond to it. You may be seated this morning. So I want us to dive right in this morning and ask, uh, uh, continuing this, uh, this idea of this question, shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? Can we, can we sin at all so that we can experience gra- continue to experience grace? These are the questions that I want to address. Number one, if you're taking notes and hopefully you have a worship guide this morning, you can fill in the blanks as we go through this. Number one, can we continue in sin after we commit to follow Jesus? Can we continue in sin after we commit to follow Jesus? The Apostle Paul starts this chapter with this question. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? Answer the question for me. Certainly not, by no means, whatever your scripture says, right? Certainly not. So Paul answers this rhetorical question adamantly. He says, of course you can't. So we know that we cannot continue in sin. But the question to me at hand is what does the Apostle Paul mean when he uses the phrase continue in sin? You know we can't continue in sin. There's no question regarding that. The question is what does he mean when he writes the phrase shall we continue in sin? And so I want us to break this down and ask this question. What does Paul mean? Does he mean that we can never sin again? Does he mean something different for us this morning that we should try to wrap our minds around? As I looked at this text and studied over the past week, I began to look and see that there are probably two logical conclusions that we could draw by what the Apostle Paul means as he says, continue in sin. It seems that Paul is either saying we should never sin again, Once we get saved, we should never sin again, or he is saying something like this, that we should not be controlled by sin any longer. It seems that there's two logical, uh, maybe explanations for the definition of what Paul is trying to tell us. Either we should never sin again if we're in Christ, or we should never let ourselves be controlled by sin any longer. Let that be the pattern of our lives. So let's look back at the language that the Apostle Paul uses throughout this text. Oftentimes, if we're not careful, we try to draw conclusions as to what the writers of the scriptures mean by only looking at one word or one phrase. And oftentimes we'll only look at one chapter or one book. We have to also, before we form a doctrine or before we form a a belief about something, we have to look at what the whole counsel of God's word says. So we can't just draw a conclusion based upon one word or one phrase of what what the Apostle Paul is trying to teach us here. So I want us to go back, just in this chapter alone, we could go back to other chapters and other books throughout the scriptures, but I want us just to go back to this chapter alone and let's ask ourselves, what does the Apostle Paul mean continue by saying, shall we continue in sin? Okay, so let's see it. Verse six, go there with me. Verse six, he says, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we, this is the phrase I want you to get, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. We should no longer be, say the word slave with me, slaves of sin. We should no longer be slaves. What does it mean to be a slave? Well, it means that you are under the authority or under the control of someone other than yourself who would own you, okay? If we were to define it, it would be something along those lines. And so the Apostle Paul says, do not allow uh, yourself to be a slave or to be under the control of or to be owned by sin. Go on down to verse 12. He says, therefore, do not let sin reign, say the word reign, reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. What does the word reign mean? Well, if a king reigns over a kingdom, what am I saying? He rules. He has control over. He has the authority over. And so here the Apostle Paul says, do not let sin reign. Have control over. Be, have the authority over your life. You see a pattern here. He says, shall we continue in sin? Certainly not. We should no longer be slaves to sin. Have someone controlling us. We should no longer let sin reign in our bodies or have someone control us. Look at verse 14. He also goes on. He says, for sin shall not have dominion over you. Say the word dominion. Okay, good. What does it mean for something to have dominion over you? 
to be control over you, right? It does not influence you, have great influence over your life. And so here the Apostle Paul in three other verses is giving us an explanation in context of what he means by shall we continue in sin. He's saying, listen, what he means by continue in sin means that sin should not have control. It should not be the pattern. It should not reign. It should not have dominion over your life. If that is a pattern of how you live your life, then there's reason to be concerned, he says. Because we shouldn't continue in sin. He says, certainly not. But we go on down and we see one more verse that I want us to look at in verse 14. He says, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Let me ask you a question. Why in your present state do you need grace if you're not sinning? Why do you need grace? If, if, if you're never going to sin again, why do we need to experience grace? Because Paul's not saying you're never going to sin again. He's saying you certainly should not let sin have control over you. It should not overpower you where it is a pattern of your life where it reigns and has dominion over your life. So I want us to understand this very clearly. Paul is teaching us that once we are followers of Jesus, we will not be allowing sin to control us, but Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, will have control over us. It's very important for us to get this principle. Paul is trying to be very clear with us. It, sin will not be the pattern of our lives. There will be a difference in how we live with Christ in us than before we lived, before we were saved. There's two types of sin that I want us to consider this morning. Two types of people kind of uh, in this category here. There are some, and I'm going to go ahead and give you the two blanks, and then we'll fill in the meat in between them if you don't go to sleep, okay? I'm going to give you two so you can write it once. Just don't go to sleep on me in between the two, all right? So here's the two. First of all, deliberate sin and incidental sin. So if you're taking notes, write down deliberate sin and then incidental sin because there's two, really two camps in this. There's these people who believe that they can just go and sin because they live under grace and they have a license to sin. So I could just go and sin. You know that once saved, always saved preacher? You know, I believe in once saved, always saved. I'm saved so I can just go do whatever I want to, preacher, and it's, I'm going to be okay with God because I'm already under grace and God has sent Jesus to save me and I know that. And so therefore, I'm just going to go do whatever I want to do and nothing can separate me. Pa preacher, don't you know Romans 8? Nothing can separate me from the love of Christ because I'm saved. I, I'm saved forever and there's nothing that can separate me. So they, they say, they fall in this idea that say because because I live under grace, I can do what I want to, and I can be in control of my life. The Apostle Paul is condemning this teaching. If you go through, if you go throughout the New Testament, you do any study in, in, in the book of Ephesus, I mean in the book of Revelation, Jesus is speaking to John to write to the church at Ephesus, and he says, I'm, I'm, I commend you for hating the work of the Nicolaitans. Some of you will remember this if you're a student of the word. The, Nicholas was one of the first deacons who was a fallen away person who was teaching false doctrine, and he was teaching the doctrine that you could just sin all you want because you're under grace. And, Je and, and Jesus in his direction to say, listen, you hate the work of the Nic Nicolaitans and so do I. Listen, G this is not how Jesus would have us to live our life. Let me just go sin because I live under grace. Let me just go live the pleasures of my life and when I get done sinning, I'll come on home and before I go to bed, I will get on my knees and I will say, Jesus, forgive me for what I have done. And everything will be okay, preacher. Don't you know that's how it works? Or maybe, you know, some people will say this. Well, preacher, I'm just going to finish sowing my wild eat, folks. I'm already a believer. I'm going to go party it up. I'm going to live it up. And one day before I die, I'm going I'm, I'm to come back and ask for forgiveness and I'll make it all right with God. But I'm good in the meantime because I prayed to receive Jesus one time. It's this idea that I can just go deliberately and live my life the way I want and I'm okay with God. I want to tell you, church, this to you, church, that I believe this is a pattern and a, and a, and a teaching that flows plentiful through the southern world, that the southern, of our, the southern states of our country, who have been indoctrinated with biblical truths their whole life. They believe that they're okay because they've just gone through some religious ritual, said some kind of prayer, did some, joined some kind of church, and they believe they're just okay. Friend, I want to tell you, it's not a biblical concept to give your life to Jesus and then live like the world. 
It's not a New Testament concept. It's not a biblical concept. Listen, yes, people will miss, miss the mark. They will make mistakes. But listen, if your life is a pattern after the world and not after Jesus, then I'm worried about your eternity. And you should be worried about your eternity. Listen, the biblical concept is people who give their life to Jesus and never went back to their old lifestyle. They left their nets. They left their families. They followed after Jesus. You see people who came to Jesus for salvation and then they did right the opposite of living for themselves. They risked their lives to follow Jesus. To do what he said, to be obedient to him. And instead of letting sin reign, Jesus reigns. And letting, instead of letting Satan have dominion, Jesus has dominion. Right? He is in control of their life. Can you imagine, I thought about illustrating it this way, can you imagine going and buying a brand new $40,000 pickup truck? Just get yourself there for a second. Whatever you want. If you want a Toyota Tundra or you want a, you know, uh, you don't want a Chevrolet, Silverado or a Ford, whatever you want to get, whatever you like, okay? Do your research. Some of them are not so good is what I understand, okay? You got problems with them. But anyways, go get your new $40,000 pickup truck. You roll it off the lot, you look for the first big tree you can find and you just ram it into that tree. Why? Because I got insurance on that thing. I got insurance. State Farm will pay for it. Boom. Got airbags in this thing too. Boom. Airbag comes out. I'm good. I got insurance. Got insurance. Insurance pays for your new pickup truck. $40,000 pickup truck was totaled. You go to the next lot. You get you another $40,000 pickup truck. You find the next big tree you can find when you get off the lot and boom, you run into it. It's okay. I got insurance. Got insurance. It's okay. Got airbags. I'm good. Let that happen a couple of times. What do you think the insurance company is going to do to you? They're going to drop you like a bad habit. You ain't going to know what to do because you won't be able to afford it if you had four jobs. Right? Why? Because insurance is not meant for you to get off the Ford dealership and then run your truck into a tree just so the insurance company can pay. But listen to me, some of us have decided to commit our lives to Jesus in some way, whether it be a prayer or a commitment of some kind early in our life, and then we get outside of the church and we just start running over trees with our new pickup truck because we're okay. I got insurance. Problem is, you only think you have insurance. You've convinced yourself you have insurance, but you don't have insurance. Because 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Paul says, shall, I continue, shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? Certainly not. You say, preacher, are you telling me I'm going to hell? I'm, I, I, listen, I'm just telling you what the scripture says. You have to decide whether what you had at some point in the past is, is, is truthfully a relationship with Jesus where he bought you with his blood and he stands at your defense before Jesus. And as we have sung today, he looks at you and says, this one is righteous because of my righteousness. The question is not, do you know Jesus, but does Jesus know you? And will he be an advocate to stand before the Father in your defense? That's the question. And the reality is, is, I believe there's a lot of people who go through their life living deliberately to commit sin after sin after sin, and they say, well, I'm just okay because I have insurance in Jesus. My friend, I tell you, you don't understand the, you don't understand the gospel. You don't understand grace if that's how you live in your life. You don't understand that grace is an expensive gift. Listen to me. Grace is expensive because it costs God his only son, Jesus Christ. And for you to live your life like that cheapens the grace of, of God through Christ Jesus. For you to live like that, friend, tells God, I don't care about your son, so therefore I'm going to choose to do what I want to do to please me instead of you. And I'm telling you, that would make me mad if I was God, and that would prove to me that you didn't have a relationship with me if you were God. If that's what it would prove to me. Deliberate sin. Let me run my truck into a tree because I have insurance. Jesus did not die on the cross to give you freedom to sin. He died on the cross to give you freedom from sin. And there is a big difference. The question should not be how much sin can I commit and still be with Jesus, but how far away of the world and sin can I get so I can follow Jesus? 
This is the question we gotta be asking. And motive makes all the difference in the world this morning. Second type of sin, incidental sin. Can I just tell you, this may be a surprise to you, but you're not gonna live a perfect life in this world. Nobody does. You mean, Brother John was wrong? Yes, Brother John was wrong. Brother John has sinned a lot since 1985. I thought I might get an amen to that. A lot! Brother John is confused as to what sin is if Brother John thinks he hadn't sinned since 1985. Listen, there's no Brother Johns in the world. Once you are saved, you start into this sanctification process. And that's a fancy word that means you're being set apart by God for a work, for his work. And you're in this sanctification process, guess what, until you die or Jesus comes back and takes you to heaven, then you get in the glorification process where you're, just, you're glorified to be just like Jesus. So the reality is, is you're being set apart by God in this process and you're not gonna achieve perfection before you go be with Jesus one day. So those people who walk around like they don't sin, guess what? Yep, they do. If you're one of those, yep, you do. Incidental sin. Sometimes we blow it. Sometimes we mess up. And guess what? God knows that. God expects that. And that's why God sent Jesus to give us his grace. That's why he sent him. Incidental sin happens. You say, oh man, I messed up. And listen, if you think you cannot commit the acts of commission, there's plenty of acts of omission that you probably blow. God says, here's something he wanted you to do and you just bypassed on by it. You missed an opportunity. You didn't just willfully, deliberately do something wrong, but hey, there was something there. Our target is perfection, but the scripture says our best effort is filthy rags. You're gonna blow it. Let me ask you this. Would you consider Peter, I mean, he wrote some New Testament truths. The whole book of Acts is you know, illustrating the life that he lived for the Father. Would you say Peter was a believer? Anybody? Do you believe Peter was a believer and a follower of Jesus? Yes or no? This is an easy Sunday school question. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes, I do too. When do you believe Peter became a follower of Jesus? Anybody got an idea? I'll help you out. I believe Peter became a follower of Jesus in Matthew 4 when Jesus said, leave behind your nets and come and follow me at the Sea of Galilee. Is that fair? Can that, is that a fair assumption? That it's somewhere among that moment, Peter counted the cost and he said, I'm going to follow after Jesus. Now let me ask you a question. Do you believe that Peter sinned any point past the time that he chose to follow after Jesus? Yes. Okay, good. We're on the same page. Peter sinned. How did Peter sin? Well, we, we, there's two very, very much in your face examples in the scriptures, aren't there? I mean, he says, he's sitting around the table having supper, the last supper with Jesus, and Jesus says, listen, somebody's going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. Oh, I would never deny. Nope, nobody's going to deny. No, we're not going to deny him. Nobody. No, who is it, Lord? All right, what, what, how's this? what happened? Peter, three times in a row, denied Jesus when he had the opportunity to speak up for Jesus. Do you believe that was sin when he did that? Of course it was. A little before that in the garden, uh, Jesus, Gethsemane, they're coming to get Jesus and Jesus decides, uh, the, the, the Roman soldiers come and Judas kisses him and betrays him with a kiss and the Roman soldiers begin to take him in. Does anybody remember what Peter did? <laughs> Took that ear off that guy. Anybody remember what Jesus said? Get behind me, Satan. Anybody think that was a sin? I would say so. Two, two kind of in-your-face sins that Peter, we see lived out in Peter's life right here. Does that mean, then by Brother John's estimate, does that mean that Peter is lost and Peter didn't know Jesus? Listen, I'm telling you, Peter wasn't no more lost after he cut that man's ear off or after he, he denied Jesus three times than he was the moment he followed after Jesus because everybody sins and that's why we need grace and that's why Jesus went to the cross. And Peter's a pretty good guy. If I was guessing, I would say Peter's better than most of us in here. Right? Peter's a better man than I am. I'm just going to be honest. He followed Jesus in a more radical way than I followed Jesus, and he's one of my heroes in the faith. And I'm going to tell you, if Peter's lost, there's a lot of people who are lost. No, 
it's incidental sin. That's why John writes in 1 John 1, 9 to the believers of the church. He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Why do we need that? Because we sin. Because we blow it. And God knows it. And that's how we have grace. Point number two. Upon receiving the gospel, we are baptized to walk in a newness of life. In verses 3 through 5, we get this illustrated. He says, you've been baptized into Christ Jesus. You were baptized in his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through his baptism into death, that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. There's this idea that we should have this newness of life in Jesus. And he refers to this illustration of baptism. Baptism can mean two things. Literally, it means to be immersed or dipped in water. But figuratively, it means to identify yourself with something or someone. When you're baptized, you're identifying yourself with Jesus. You're saying, I affiliate. It's your first testimony of faith saying, I'm with him publicly. John MacArthur says it this way, water baptism is an outward identification of an internal reality, faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's an outward expression of an inward reality. So when a person is baptized, they're identifying themselves with Jesus, specifically in this case with his death, burial, and resurrection. And what they're saying is sometimes people baptize us, say, buried in Christ, raised to do what? Walk in the newness of his life or walk in the likeness of, his, of him. This is, this is a picture of what they're talking about. It's, listen, symbolically, it's referencing going under the water, coming back up. You're identifying with Jesus. The old self is old. The new self has come back up. He's saying, now you're to walk in a newness of life. The moment I gave my life to Christ, Brad died so Jesus could live. Friend, let me ask you a question. When you gave your life to Jesus, were you baptized into his death and raised into his resurrection to walk in a newness of life? Because Brad dies so Jesus can live. That's all, that's all we're getting here. That's all we're getting here from the Apostle Paul. It's that Galatians 2.20, for I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who died or loved me and gave himself for me. It's, it, this is what it's about here. The result of me dying with Christ is that he resurrects me to walk in the newness of life. And the Apostle Paul is saying, listen, you need to be dead to sin and alive to Jesus. The power of the gospel is that you are to be alive. Not dead. Not dead in sin. I died to the, what do you say, what do I die to? A friend of mine wrote a song that's told the Sunday school class not too long ago. It was called, Lord, I Want to Die. And it was written off of Matthew, the book of Matthew. And talking about how we're to die to self and live, to Je live for Jesus. And listen, the picture of the gospel is that you die. What do you die to? You die to sin and you die to self and you're raised to live for Jesus alive in Christ. That's what the Apostle Paul's saying. So, so let me ask you this question. If Christianity is about dying, have you died? Have you surrendered? Have you been raised to walk in a newness of life? Have you been resurrected in Jesus? Because if there's no newness of life, then there is no salvation. As I quoted 2 Corinthians 5, 17 a little earlier, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Are you a new creation today? What about you? Have you died so that Christ could live? I like what the Apostle Paul tells the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5. He gives them a chance to evaluate themselves. And he says, examine yourselves as to whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not yourselves know that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? Test yourselves. Examine yourselves. Take this text in Romans 6. Am I a Christ follower? Point number three, and I want to close with this. The gospel sets you free from the bondage of sin. In verses 6 through 10, we get a picture of this, but 7 is what I want to read. Verse 7. For he who has died has been freed from sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin from sin. But you know, I know so many people approach me or maybe they're sitting out there even today thinking this, Pastor, I don't feel free from sin. Pastor, I find myself sinning and sometimes I find myself going back and doing the same thing over that I really don't want to do, but I keep struggling with sin in my life. Pastor, I don't feel free from sin. 
Unfortunately, church, we're going to war with sin for the rest of our life. It's not going to be fun. It's going to be tough. It's going to be challenging. I'm struggling with sin, pastor. Help me find how I can be free. And I say this, the Apostle Paul could relate. How many of you think the Apostle Paul was saved? Really? Yep. Okay, good. The rest of you, I'm really worried that you've never read the Bible before. <laughs> he, of course he was saved. Well, then what does he mean when he writes in Romans 7 and verse 15, For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. You mean the Apostle Paul was struggling, warring against the flesh, and he wrote most of the New Testament? Yep. Yep, he struggled. He probably struggled with legalism, if I'm being honest. There's probably times where some of this oldness came back in his life where he struggled with it. I don't know what he was struggling with, but it seems that he's helping us to understand that it's normal for us to struggle with sin. And I would say to you that if you're struggling with sin, that's better than just going and willfully partaking in sin. It's actually encouraging that you're struggling with it. That means maybe inside of you, the Holy Spirit is at work inside of you, telling you, listen, this is not right. This is not good. You need to change your way. You need to do something different. You need to alter your course of direction. And that's why you feel like you feel. Listen, brothers and sisters, if you're struggling, I think that's a good sign. It's the ones that don't struggle I'm worried about. It's the ones that live in it month after month, year after year, decade after decade, and claim some kind of promise way from way back or some hope from way back when that never impacted their life that I'm worried about. So how do I experience this freedom? Well, 11 through 14 gives us three quick things. First of all, reckon yourself dead to sin and alive to God. We're in the South, so we all know what the word reckon means, right? <laughs> I reckon. I guess. Maybe. Get that out of your mind, because that's not what the Apostle Paul is trying to tell us. Okay? That's not what he's trying to say. I guess or I suppose. That's not it. This word is a Greek word that means to put to one's account. Warren Wiersbe says it this way. Reckoning is not claiming a promise, but acting on a fact. On a fact. You live your life dead to sin and alive to God. That's what the Apostle Paul says. He says, reckon yourself to be dead to sin and alive to God. What is he saying? Listen, he's not saying God commands you to be dead to sin and alive to, to, alive to God. Here's what he's saying. You are dead to sin and alive to God. Reckon yourself. Come to grips. Put to your account. Write yourself a check. Take it to the bank and know that it's good. That listen, he has put to your account that you are dead to sin and alive to God. That's what the Apostle Paul's saying. I don't suppose it. I don't, I don't guess at it. Listen, take it to the bank. It's the difference of this. I'm not attaining to be a pastor. I am a pastor. My identity is found in Jesus. I'm not trying to be a Christian. I am a Christian. He says, just accept the fact. Reckon yourself that you're dead to sin and alive to God. It's who you are. Second thing, do not allow sin to reign in your life. Don't let it fester. Don't let it take root. Repent of sin regularly. You say, how do, how do I experience this freedom? Reckon yourself alive to God. Don't allow sin in your life to fester. When your child or maybe you, you come in with a cut, it's good to put some peroxide on that, right? It's good to put some antibiotic ointment on that, right? My mama used to put cathophonique. Anybody ever use that old stuff? Woo! It'd make you scream. But you know what it did? You know what it did? It took care of the wound. It helped it to recover and to repair itself. Because you know what? Just a simple infection in other countries will cause you to lose your hand if it's not taken care of. Here's what the Apostle Paul saying. Listen, don't let it rain. Don't let it take root. Don't let it control you because over time it gets to a point that the only thing you can do is amputate to get rid of that problem on your hand. Don't let it get to that point. 
Confess your sin before God. Repent. Be brought back right with God. You say sin is the same way. Deal with sin regularly. Get yourself in an accountability group, a D group. Get yourself in the Word daily. Repent regularly. Lastly, and I want to close with this. Present yourself to God as an instrument of righteousness. How do I experience freedom, Pastor? Claim or reckon that you are alive. Don't let sin reign or fester in your life. And then get busy serving God. Here's what I found. When you present yourself as an instrument to God to be used, it grows you and helps you confirm who you are in Christ. When you go on a mission trip, when you stand up and say, I'll teach that Sunday school class, when you volunteer for vacation Bible school, listen, when you go out to serve the community on a community service project, here's what happens. You get more out of it than the people you go to serve do. That's what happens. And you know what? When you present yourself to God as an instrument of righteousness, you almost all also have some form of accountability built in your life that you want to be who you say you are before you go out there. And so that's how you can experience freedom in Jesus. You're not condemned. There is therefore now no con condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 verse 1. Experience it, trust it, reckon yourself to that. I want to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. Today, the best I know how, I have expounded upon the truths of Romans 6. And I believe that God has brought me to this point today for a purpose. I believe there are people here who need to experience freedom in Jesus. For some of you, you sat there the whole time. You said, Pastor, I just don't know that I'm even a believer and I need to be saved. The great news is, is that Jesus stands ready to welcome you home right now and say, I will let you, I will receive you as my own. I will stand at your defense. You can have my righteousness. Just trust me. Come and give your life to me. For some of you, that's what needs to happen. For others of you, Maybe you need to repent of sin so that sin will continue to fester in your life and have reign and victory over you. I don't know what it is that you need to do today, but I ask that you would respond to Jesus as his word has been preached. That you would say, as I said to start this service, my yes is on the table. I present myself as an offering, holy and acceptable unto God, which is my reasonable service. God, I'm yours. I need to experience your forgiveness and your freedom because I'm alive in Jesus. Maybe you need to trust that, say that to Jesus. I invite you to come this morning. Maybe you need to be baptized. You've never been baptized. I invite you to come. I'd love to talk to you and help you on your journey. Maybe you want to join this church. I invite you to come. We need people to come and commit themselves to be used as instruments of God unto righteousness. Then you come. However I can help you, today I want to help you in your journey. If you just need somebody to pray with you because there's a battle going on in your life that you need help with, then you come. Somebody will join you and pray for you. Father, move in this time, move in this place, move in our hearts and help us to say yes to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand a time of, a time of response, a time to commit yourself unto the Lord. You be obedient to Jesus today before you leave this place. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. You want to make your pew an altar? That's fine. Just kneel where you are. Sit where you are. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. sin 
Lord at this time to take up this morning's offering. You may be seated. Father God, we humbly come before you this morning, uh, thanking you for all the blessings of life, Lord. Thank you for this place. Thank you for this church where we can worship you and glorify your name. Take these tithes and offerings and use them for your glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Just a couple things this morning. I'm going to ask if Caleb Bain would come. Caleb has uh, been coming for maybe about eight or nine months now as a, with our college ministry. Uh, he wants to come and unite in fellowship with Greenbrier Road Baptist Church. He wants to uh, move his membership from the Smyrna Baptist Church in Newell, Alabama. His First of all, uh, Vicki Moore's dad has, uh, now he doesn't know all these details, but he has had a heart attack. He is in the hospital at uh, RMC. Um, he is having some issues, and so they're doing uh, some work on him today. And so she is not here, but uh, I wanted to make that mention to you so you can be praying for her. Probably be doing some kind of uh, procedure by Tuesday anyways if they can get him stable enough uh, with his breathing and other things. So you be in prayer for them. Uh, Miss Dorothy Box, I spoke with her. She wants to make me uh, let me extend a uh, special thank you to her church family. She said she told me this. She said they are my family. They're not my church family. They are my family. You make sure they know that. And I'm grateful. She tell, tell them that I'm grateful for how they ministered to me in the time I lost my my son and my sickness. So please know that. Uh, I tried to send a one call now out on Friday, but I could not get it to work. But Russell Hammock's mom passed away a week or so ago, um, which her services were yesterday. Please continue to pray for Russell and Natasha and his family uh, as they went and laid her to rest yesterday uh, at a memorial service. I would ask that you pray for them and minister to them anyway uh, that they're, they're laid on your heart from the Lord. All right, another thing that I want to mention, and then I'll get Bradley up here, is uh, today marks a special anniversary. It's the first year of us uh, having Tyler. Where's Tyler at? And Bradley. We're still glad y'all are here. We don't know if y'all still like us. We're still glad y'all are here. And we love you and appreciate your commitment to Greenbrier and all that you do. And uh, the church has a little special gift to get you this week. So uh, I know you, you'll, uh, we're blessed and I know y'all are uh, blessing to us in so many ways. So that's what I have. And I'm going to ask if Bradley would come and share a couple more announcements. And then uh, we'll be dismissed. 
just a couple, and uh, hopefully this week will go smoother than last week's announcements. Uh, tonight at 5 o'clock is our Sunday Night Live, so please come back tonight at 5. Uh, be an encouragement to our kiddos who are going to be up here doing the Sermon on the Mound. Um, I know it's going to mean a lot for them to see a bunch of faces out here, so please come back tonight for that. Um, uh, there's, uh, If you didn't grab a um, worship guide on your way in, please get one on your way out. Um, <clears throat> there's some information about a mission trip coming up. Also, I do want to point out, uh, if you did not get a form to help us uh, sell uh, Boston Butts, please grab one of those. Please help us sell those. Um, that's a great fundraiser for our uh, for our mission trip to Nicaragua. Uh, May the 4th is uh, not only Star Wars Day, but is also the National Day of Prayer. Uh, so, um, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> There's information on there uh, for the National Day of Prayer, how to connect with the city of Oxford. The mayor of Oxford uh, has, has really gone above and beyond, I think, to, to make prayer a priority and is trying to get a, uh, as many people as he can uh, together to pray for the city of Oxford. I think that's a big deal, and so I certainly want to encourage you to get uh, connected there. Um, there's also uh, uh, other stuff in your worship guide. Uh, youth camp is coming up. If you got a student that you want to get rid of for a few days, uh, July 27th through the... Th that didn't sound... Youth camp is July 27th through 30th. We'd love for your student to be plugged in. There's a little bit of information there, and we're going to be presenting more information as time goes on. So uh, please uh, help us to uh, be in prayer for that and for the work that God is, is going to do at youth camp. Let me pray for you, and, and then announcements will end. So let's pray together. God, thank you for this morning. Lord, um, thank you for the opportunity that we've had to worship and, uh, and study uh, your word together. And God, uh, you know the hurts that have been uh, uh, and, and, and the things that are going on in our church body with, with uh, recent uh, deaths and sickness and, and other things. God, I pray uh, your blessings on those families. God, I pray comfort and healing uh, there and, uh, and ultimately that you'd be glorified even in those situations. And Father, we pray that you would help us to live gospel-centered lives. God, help us, to, uh, help us to not have a desire to continue in sin, uh, Father, but to live in the freedom that you've given us through your son Jesus. We pray for a good week and we pray ahead of uh, for tonight, God, that, that you'd be glorified in the in the work and uh, and 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 the uh, and, and the efforts of these kiddos tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.